Welcome to the Stronger Than Steel podcast with your hosts, Austin Davidson and John Keir, talking Steelers all the time. Now, here's Austin and John. Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Keir and joining me as always is my co-host, Austin Davidson. Hello. Today it is season four, episode 55. Happy Friday, Austin. Happy Friday to you as well. We are approaching what could be the last game of Steelers football for the 2019 season. And here we are, deja vu all over again. The Steelers, in order to make the playoffs, are going to have to win on Sunday. And they're going to need to get help. Last year, the Steelers were able to defeat the Cincinnati Bengals, but were not aided by the Cleveland Browns, who lost to the Baltimore Ravens. And as a result... The Steelers missed the playoffs, so here, uh, the second year in a row, the Steelers face that same type of scenario. This time they'll be on the road in Baltimore, and they'll need the easiest scenario would be the Titans to lose to the Houston Texans, so not a great outlook for sure. Uh, you really wish that the Steelers were able to control their own destiny, and if they win tonight uh, on Sunday, they, they can make it in, but uh, unfortunately with that loss to the Jets, it really hurts them, and uh, we now we have to hope for the Texans to possibly uh, play backups and win against uh, the Tennessee Titans, which is unideal. Uh, kind of just hoping Derrick Henry can't play for that game and that helps him out, but uh, I don't have a good feeling uh, going into Sunday. The only good thing that you could probably state is that, you know, when you – this is going to be the same case with the Ravens. It's not like it's all backups. It's just about, you know, seven to ten guys that aren't going to be playing – and it's going to be played in Houston. Remember, Houston has already beaten Tennessee in Tennessee this year. But, again, this is one team with a lot more to play for than the other. So I think that even though it's human nature to still play hard in these games, I think there's a, there's clearly a lot more on the line for the Titans in this one. Yeah, it's just going to be tough. It's going to be tough to uh, have to – it's going to be tough for the Texans. Uh, I'll play that because the Texans don't really have a lot to play for. Uh, especially if the Chiefs win. The Chiefs win, it's just like the Texans could just sit to Sean Watson from there. And uh, it doesn't help that that game is at 1 o'clock for them, so that they'll be able to know. Uh, basically, they won't be able to put out their inactive list uh, before that, so I'm sure they're going to go with the assumption that the Chiefs will lose and they're going to not make like any of their starters inactive. I mean, no, they're just going to do that for that sake because you can't bet on – like you can't bet on uh, bad things happening. You know, you have to hope for the best and just go on. But uh, they're probably going to end up benching uh, Watson as soon as they see that the Chiefs win. If Maybe they'll play him for a quarter and stuff. So uh, that doesn't help. And do you have any problem with the way the NFL flexes these games? Because, again, it would have made more sense for maybe the Chiefs game, for the Chiefs Chargers game, the Texans Titans, and the Steelers Ravens game to have all been played at the same time. But uh, like you just said, there's a good chance the Texans will go into the game with nothing to play for whatsoever. Yeah, uh, I don't like it. I they did they flex the Steelers one to 425. I believe they f also flex the t Titans Texans game to 425 and they were both originally at one. But um, I mean it is what it is. I guess you get unlucky and stuff like that happens. I really wish that uh, Tennessee wasn't uh, flexed at, uh, flexed up. I mean if they if they and the Chiefs played at the same time, I'd be okay. And the Steelers played at 425 because at least then the Steelers know what's going on. The Steelers. Uh, can watch what the, what happens with the two teams and see what happens. But, I mean, it is what it is. I get why people are mad, but I'm still more frustrated with the Steelers than I am anything else. It's their fault for being in this position. 100%. So that being said, the Steelers, in a game with the, where they need to win, they are playing the best team in the NFL, a team in Baltimore that is 13-2 and two and won the AFC in terms of uh, home field advantage. For the first time in their team's history, the only good thing about that is the fact that the Ravens are going to be resting several starters. So when you have a seven-man inactive list, if you're just not going to include injuries, there's going to be a handful of players that the Ravens are going to be sitting, including guys like Lamar Jackson, Earl Thomas, Marshall Yonda, and Brandon Williams. Another player in Mark Ingram, their starting running back, is out with an ankle injury. There's still some moving parts, though, but those seem to be the guys that definitely won't be playing. But it's certainly possible that there's others that are inactive or maybe others that play just a few series. Do you have any thoughts on that or just initial reaction to the players that it looks like won't be playing in this one? 
Yeah, those are the ones that are reportedly not playing, and that leaves two more spots with all five of those guys being out. Uh, I could see Mark Andrews taking a six six spot, and then that seven spot is kind of up in the air. They had Marquise Brown, uh, who had was kept out of practice on Friday with an illness. He's an option, but I think that more than likely you let him play because he's a younger guy. Uh, and then uh, you really cut, you have like guys like Marlon Humphrey, uh, Matthew Judon, or Marcus Peters, who are candidates as well for that last spot. Uh, honestly, you can make Mark Andrews active. I just wouldn't do it. Uh, but uh, so it's going to be a toss up for those last two spots who they choose to make inactive. If any of those guys, they might just choose to let a few of their starters still play. Well, let's just roll with the assumption that it's going to be at this time just Ingram. Jackson, Thomas, Yonda, and Williams. Let's just assume it's those guys for the sake of the argument. That's still a huge, huge, that's still a huge tipping point in favor of the Steelers, something that they're obviously going to need. What are the Ravens losing without those players in the lineup? Uh, Well, I mean, with uh, losing Lamar Jackson, uh, luckily you have, like, his budget version, like the really super budget version, RG3. I don't know if RG3 can really run anymore. Definitely not like Lamar Jackson. There ain't going to be anyone that runs like Lamar Jackson, but he is that mobile quarterback, and uh, that's not going to be able to pass as much. Uh, and, I mean, in the past, when he was in his, the beginning of his career, he used to run around a lot, uh, similar to Lamar Jackson. But So losing him is big. Marshall Yonda, another big one that their offensive line isn't going to be as good, it feels like. Um Brandon Williams, I think, is the least impactful one. I'm not sure why he was picked over Judon. Judon's been uh, Judon's a pro bowler. Uh, he's been uh, one of the better ones for their team, so I don't know why he wasn't one of the ones that was definitely, reportedly definitely picked. To me, that made sense, but uh, uh, then Earl Thomas is, is big. I don't think Earl Thomas has played that well this year, but he's still pretty good uh, free safety, so overall, the team is definitely weaker. Uh, and that should play in the Steelers' favor. But, I mean, we've seen Steelers blow a game to a Ryan Mallett-led Ravens. I, I, I wouldn't rule it out, especially with the offense not being able to uh, do anything last week against the Jets. And the drop-off from a guy like Mark Ingram to Gus Edru- or Gus, Gus Ed- oh my goodness, Gus Edwards. Uh, the drop-off to Gus Edwards I don't really think is that big from just a pure downhill running standpoint. Last season, Gus Edwards finished with the best – successful run rate percentage in the NFL. I don't know if you knew that. I did actually know that. I was a big fan of Gus Edwards. He was on my fantasy team last year. Yeah, I don't I, – I, I wasn't crazy about the fact that he he had such a reduced role because I thought he was so effective last year. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, they, obviously Mark Ingram was a little bit of a step up. He's that veteran presence. But uh, uh, what I liked about Gus Edwards is he never fumbled either. In, in, in all of his snaps, he never fumbled. He was really secure with the ball. But, uh, I mean, it is what it is. The Ravens chose to bring in extra help, and, you know. It's not like it, it was a bad choice. I mean, Ingram has been fantastic. Oh, yeah, exactly. So it's not like it hurt them in any way. But um, uh, I guess it doesn't hurt you to have that uh, several good running backs in your arsenal. On the Steelers' side, there's a handful of players that are dealing with injuries. So we already know that Mason Rudolph was placed on injured reserve. He's out for the season. Marquise Pouncey and James Conner, the two other players with injuries from last week's game, were both declared out. So it's going to be B.J. Finney at center again, and a combination of Steelers running backs probably leading the way will be Benny Snell in the backfield. Uh, you know, it's, it's just uh, more hits for an offense that has already struggled mightily this year. Yeah, it's not exactly great. You really don't like to see it. And with James Conner being out, like, for what, I think he's played in three of his last nine games, it's just really rough for him. He's had a really rough year and, for the most part, a really rough career with how injury-wise it's been. I mean, when he gets on the field, he's pretty good. But uh, uh, it's just he's been struggling to stay on the field. And uh, availability is the best ability. It it, it really comes down to that. So he's really been struggling. But I, I have hope that... Against a weaker defense, the uh, the other running backs will be able to step up. I'm hoping for a little bit more out of Kareth White, actually. I, I hope to see a little bit more Kareth White in this game because he's a back that the Ravens weren't really able to see the last time they, they versed since he was not part of the Steelers at the time. Uh, so I feel like he could be uh, big in this game. Uh, Benny Snell, 
I have hope for, but Benny Snell seems on or off. Like in the last game against the Jets, granted the Jets had one of the best, have the best uh, rush defense in the league in terms of yards per carry. He rushed seven times for 14 yards, and I mean that's not ideal, but I feel like Kareth White's going to be the difference maker. If if I were to pick one running back to make a, a difference maker out of the carousel of running backs the Steelers have, I think uh, White's going to be the difference maker in this game. One thing that does help with Brandon Williams being out, he's their big run plugger. And if the Steelers are going to be able to have any success in this game on offense, it's going to come from being able to run the ball, and that's something they haven't done for two weeks now. It's going to be rough. I mean, luckily not having Brandon Williams, like you said, is a good thing for them. He's been a body down the middle, sort of like Damone uh, Harrison down in Detroit. But uh, overall, it, I just still don't feel good. I, 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 like I said, the only guy I feel about is Kareth White. I don't really feel good about the run game in this game. I don't think it's going to be established. The, we've seen too many concerning trends to think that anything is going to change. Let's take a step back and look at the Steelers and Ravens as a whole. Obviously, the Ravens moved from Cleveland and became the Baltimore Ravens franchise in 1996. These teams have met uh, obviously twice a year, sometimes three times a year since then. The Steelers hold a slim 28-23 to advantage. The Ravens won the first game between these two teams in overtime in Week 5, 26-23. And the, just a fun fact, the Steelers are going to be starting their third quarterback in as many games against the Ravens with Devlin Hodges. They started Mason Rudolph in Week 5, and the last time they played in 2018, Ben Roethlisberger was the starting quarterback. Uh, so, again, as we already know, the Steelers have had a ton of turnover at the quarterback position this year. And with, even though Hodges is starting, I think it's quite obvious that there's a solid chance. I certainly would have, wouldn't bet against it that Paxton Lynch would see snaps in this game. It's certainly possible. There's definitely a chance. I mean, we saw how short of the leash Devlin Hodges was on last week. And, I mean, at this point, what, when do you say that Devlin Hodges should come out for Paxton Lynch? What, what do you think has to happen for Paxton Lynch to come in? Well, let's look at what it's taken the – both quarterbacks to get benched so far this year. For Mason Rudolph, he had a half and a drive uh, that included three points, so one scoring drive uh, and one turnover, plus a very horrible-looking pass, which was his last. And for Hodges, it was a two. It was two turnovers in the first half. I think it might have been the first quarter. One of them being of the red zone variety. So you take that into account. I think. I think two turnovers will do it, and I also think that less than two scoring drives will also do it through one half. I think that's a fair evaluation. I was thinking the same thing for the turnovers. I think two does it. I mean, you saw how quick they were to bench uh, Hodges last week after the two bad turnovers. I think it doesn't matter if it's red zone either. I think that uh, two turnovers, no matter what, is going to get him benched. And then uh, what's it called? Uh, I I also – I say even – I say a little bit different, I think. I think that if if they're not able to muster – no, I actually agree. I think if they can't get two scoring drives, then the, they're going to bench Hodges for Pax and Lynch. Obviously, they don't feel comfortable about it because they're not just naming Pax and Lynch the starter after uh, benching Hodges last week. So it might be a little bit harder than we think, but we'll have to see. The other thing to point out is that – Paxton Lynch has only taken real reps in practice. This is probably only the second time this year that's happened, the other being when Hodges had to start in L.A. against the Chargers. So he's probably a lot less ready than Hodges was when he had to come in. Not that Hodges had a ton of reps, but if there are any leftover scrap reps that go to the backup, it's been either Rudolph or Hodges back and forth. It hasn't been Lynch with the exception of that one week and now this week. So... I'm not saying that that's something that's going to really make an impact in the decision. It's just something to consider. Definitely is. And you know what's something good to hang uh, that you can hang your hat on? Devlin Hodges probably at his best, looked best in the Ravens game when he had to come in for the injured uh, Mason Rudolph. So maybe he'll have some magic again against the Baltimore Ravens the second time. And if Lynch has to play, this can be... You can take this however you want, probably a negative, but one good thing is that uh, no one's seen any tape of Paxton Lynch outside of the preseason in two years. His last start was Week 17 in 2017, so we're coming up on two years since his last NFL action in the regular season. 
Uh, and honestly, I mean, even in the tape from then, you could basically throw it out because he's just garbage anyway. Hey, so it doesn't was, really matter. It was it was pretty bad. <laughs> oh man, it's pretty bad. But bad has been the Steelers' offense this year, and they haven't really been able to hang their hat on anything. So what's the thing we've been saying is the biggest part of what this offense needs to do besides being able to run the ball? It's been what? T- not turning the football over, right? And they can't turn over the football. They can't shoot themselves in the foot. And this is why they've been struggling the past couple of weeks. They've been shooting themselves in the foot. Like after like they were doing fine. Their defense doesn't give up more than – doesn't allow more than 20 points a game from the uh, uh, opponent. It, like it hasn't happened in several weeks now since the Colts game I think we said on the last podcast. So it's just like you need to be able to score 20 points and that's it. And that, that comes from not turning over the ball just take and, and playing safe with the ball. You'll get your opportunities. The defense is going to allow you to have your opportunities, but you just can't shoot yourself in the foot. So no Brandon Williams. That's obviously a big part in the middle of their defense. Possibly, or already also, no Earl Thomas. So you're possibly looking at a starting safety and starting nose tackle being out. Possibly a guy like uh, Matthew Judon not being in there as well. How would you attack this Ravens defense? I think that you're best running straight up the middle. I mean, I wish that you had Marquise Pouncey. That's it's really rough. But I mean, if you, I know, I know, I said I'm not confident about establishing the run game, but you definitely got to try and do it. I mean, you're not confident in any of your quarterbacks at this point. You got to try and uh, get a run game going and hope that it works. And I think that going down the middle with no Brandon Williams and like you said, no Earl Thomas is going to be the best. And then if like you said, if Matthew Judon's out, then you attack that side as well as attack the middle. But I think the middle should be the main focal point. Uh, obviously, if Finney's struggling in the run blocking game, you change it up and you uh, switch it to try and switch the outsides and again attack the side that uh, is going to be weaker with, with uh, who they choose to keep out. But um, overall, I think the middle should be the best because I mean, their inside linebackers are also they're starting inside linebackers aren't even that that good. I mean, they had to sign Josh Bynes for the first uh, first meeting between these two teams. So it's just like I, I feel like the running down the middle is where you attack them. I'm not – even though with no Earl Thomas, it, it sounds like it would be a good idea to do the deep throw. I just don't trust the quarterbacks we have for the deep throw right now. It's just – it's not what I feel comfortable with, and especially if like Marlon Humphrey and Marcus Peters are still playing. Like at, at this point, either Marlon Humphrey or Marcus Peters is definitely playing, I think. Uh, one one or the other. There's there's just no possible way that they're both inactive. I think you got to make Mark Andrews one of the uh, two remaining spots inactive. So you know, the cornerbacks are still going to be pretty solid, and uh, I I wouldn't want to attack those guys. How dare you sully L.J. Fort's name like that? I did sully L.J. Fort's name. I said it. I was like thinking about the inside linebackers, like oh L.J. Fort's in there. I felt like you were going to say something, but I, I it's just, he's still he's played well. He's still not that great. And he had probably his best game of the year against the Steelers earlier in the year, at least from a special team standpoint. I've got a bad feeling he's going to wreck the game on Sunday. That just feels like what he's going to do. Yeah, it's definitely possible. I would be pulling David DeCastro on almost every play. I, Just I, let him block for everyone? I, I kid a little bit. Obviously, that involves needing your left side of the line to block well, and they haven't the last two weeks, but... I just I feel like we haven't seen much of it the last two weeks. And like you said, I don't really know what you can do to get this ground game going. It's been flawed all year. Maybe this the last two weeks we've seen where the Steelers have really missed Mike Munchak. And again, it is a player execution issue as well. But we're seeing schematic issues in terms of the run coordination and in terms of pass protection. I think this is really the first time you can say you've missed Mike Munchak because this is the first time we've seen noticeable drops in what I, I – what I point the finger at is coaching here. This is the first time I've been able to say that. Yeah, there's a lapse in coaching, which is really, really strange. It's un, it's unexplored territory for us for quite a while now. I mean, we've been spoiled with Mike Munchak's coaching for uh, to, to scheme around like blitzes and twists and all this stuff, and now it's up to uh, uh, Sean Sarrett. So, well, especially I mean, especially when yeah. you consider how they started the se- they had a couple rough games at the beginning of the year. But you wouldn't expect them to suddenly get worse at this stage of the season. You'd expect these struggles at the beginning, not at the end. Oh yeah, for sure. It's just it, it feels like teams should have if if 
say this. Like, teams should have been able to catch on earlier if, if uh, it was, like, mostly coaching. So, I don't know. Maybe it's, it feels like this is why it's a combination of things. It, it feels like if this was a straight-up coaching problem, uh, teams would have been attacking earlier. I don't know if the Bills were just the first team to catch on and figure out, like, oh, wow, we found where the, the problem is, and then the Steelers realized they couldn't fix it. But they definitely need to fix it for this last game. It's just they got to, they had to have schemed something in practice to block the blitzes that the Jets and Bills were sending at the Steelers. The Ravens are also one of those teams where I'm, I'm sure you know this, Austin, but whenever teams empty, this will run an empty set against the Ravens more often than they'll, or more often than not, they'll default to that zero blitz where they bring one extra blitzer. Then you have blocker and they force a quick throw. And I think that's how that might be how, Marcus Peters has one of his pick sixes this year. That's like an automatic blitz call for the Ravens. So be ready if you're Duck Hodges to throw the ball early and quickly. And even though the DBs still scare me, I think you still have to take a couple shots in this game because if you don't, you're going to get suffocated out there. And it's probably still going to happen anyways. But you, I, I just I think you have to take your shots at some point here. Uh, I just think that the defense can contain the offense. I think the the def, the to me the Ravens defense isn't as hurt as their offense. Taking away the MVP from the team is just is just too much. And I, my last memories of RG three are not good ones. So maybe uh, I'm undermining him a lot. But I just think that the Steelers are going to have a lot of chances in this game, and this game is not really going to get away from them. Uh, I, I'm not even like. I, I just feel like the, the, it's going to be on the offense to, to try and win this, but I don't think the game is ever going to be with like out of reach. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like I, I don't even feel like the deep shots are required because I think that the Ravens' offense is going to struggle so much that I don't think it's going to matter. So you think the Steelers are going to essentially have short fields on offense to, and that's how they're going to score their points? I mean, that that's fair because they did score seven of their ten points last week on a short field. Yeah, I think they're in much better position this week, uh, for uh, for sure. Because with our, I, I just don't trust an RG three. And I mean, if they're going to be down Mark Andrews as well, their wide receivers aren't really that good. And I mean, uh, if Marquise plays, he's going to be a little bit under the weather. He's he was sick on Friday. I mean, he could be recovered by then. But uh, regardless, I just don't trust RG three. I think RG three is going to throw a lot of ducks. Uh, is from because he's not like Lamar Jackson. He's not as uh, he can't just rely on his legs in this game. Lamar Jackson has been literally riding the season on his legs. I've never seen a quarterback do what he's done because uh, he doesn't even throw that much in the game. Lamar Jackson throws when it's smart, and that, and that's all he needs. He doesn't throw all too much. I don't think that's going to work with RG three. RG three is not the quarterback he was in twenty twelve. Uh, it's just it's not going to go the same way for him. I feel more comfortable. And even last time when the Steelers versus Lamar Jackson, I'm talking Lamar Jackson all up like this. He threw three interceptions. I mean, I'm sure they're uh, going to do a little bit better if Lamar. They would do a little bit better this time if Lamar Jackson was playing. But I'm just, I'm just thinking that um, RG three is going to make too many mistakes, uh, especially compared to what Lamar Jackson would do if he was here. Lamar Jackson's three highest passing totals of the season were in the first three weeks. I don't know if you knew that. I actually did, and one of them was on like literally the back of Jesus Christ himself, Chiefs game when he gave up. He got two fourth down conversions on like the literally he needed to to pray to Jesus for them to be completed. I don't know if you remember those. They're stuck in my head because I still, uh, I just I, I remember thinking how the Ravens could be so lucky to to get two fourth down calls on like fourth and eighteen. I do remember that. I just. I think that if the Steelers are going to win this game, it's going to take more than just being able to take advantage of the turnovers you get uh, because you also have to look at it. The Steelers have the worst red zone offense in the league, and uh, let's be honest, the game is won and lost on third down and in the red zone. So, yeah, I mean, we already know about the Steelers' struggles on third down this year. It's just it's it's not going to be easy. We already know that this offense struggles with so much. And I guess I don't really know what I'm hanging my hat on. Maybe you're hoping that Smith Schuster can come back with a better week this week. Maybe he can be a difference maker. I really think that you're going to need a couple of explosive plays. You're going to need one long touchdown drive to win this game. And while I don't disagree with you that I think the defense will play well, they also haven't been generating turnovers the way that they have most of the season the last two weeks. So I'm a little concerned from that standpoint, and I think that you're going to have to be able to – you're going to have to score two offensive touchdowns at least in this game. 
Mm. Uh, I honestly think this is going to be a lower scoring game than that. Uh, I, I might be, again, I might be underestimating what RG3 can do. I just think that this game is going to be lower scoring than, uh, requ- like, really low scoring. I, I'm thinking, like, single digits for both teams, possibly, uh, is, is the thing that happens. Because I don't trust the Steelers' offense, but then I don't trust the Ravens' offense against the Steelers' defense. So, uh, I, uh, it's just, uh, I guess I view it just a little bit differently. Well, then let's look at the Ravens' side. So, they're going to be without one of their best offensive linemen in team history, Marshall Yonda. You already talked about Lamar Jackson not being there, and we talked a little bit about Mark Ingram not being there, but they've still got Gus Edwards and Justice Hill. Here's something that I hadn't really thought about. So you talked about how Robert Griffin is you know, the discount Lamar Jackson. Do you think there's any possibility that the Ravens, because you know, Lamar Jackson plays a, a dangerous game. He's been healthy so far, but it can change in a hurry. Do you think there's any possibility that the Ravens could go into halftime? doesn't matter what's going on in the game, and they say, you know what? Let's not risk RG3, and let's put Trace McSorley back there. I think for sure they do. I think they want to see what they got on Trace McSorley because, I mean, uh, what's it called? RG3 can't last forever. He's he's sort of he's older now. He was drafted in 2012, and it's just like I think they're going to want to evaluate Trace McSorley, if anything. I think it, eventually uh, he will come in, even if it's just for, like, the last quarter or maybe, a, like, a two drives or something like that. I think it's totally possible we see uh, Trace McSorley, especially with them wanting RG three to be their their backup. I, I think I think we will see some uh, Trace McSorley in this game. But you see why I'm saying that too, just because of there's you know our Robert Griffin the third might be discount, but he can at least run an offense similar to what Lamar Jackson runs. I'm not sure that McSorley can right now, but. We, we are kind of already talked about Griffin is probably the best backup to Lamar Jackson because of how similar their styles are. Yeah, this game means nothing to them. They should risk, like, their preseason guys, if anything. And if you want, uh, they should definitely, uh, I, I, if I were them, I would just literally probably play Trace McSorley for a half just to see what I got. Uh, and like you said, I mean, RG3 is, is a guy fit if, uh, what's it called, if uh, Lamar Jackson got hurt in the playoffs or something, he's more fit to run the offense than... Uh, Trace McSorley is, so you might as well. You have all these reasons to play Trace McSorley. Why not? So without Mark Ingram, their guys, as I mentioned, were Edwards and Hill, and on the outside they've got Miles Boykin, Marquise Brown, Willie Sneed, and they've got the tight ends Nick Boyle and Hayden Hurst. Uh, No one really stands out a ton, but they've all contributed this year. Yeah, uh, I I thought Hayden Hurst was going to be better at the NFL level. It was, he came out, and my biggest gripe was that he was older. He's 25 when he's a rookie, and he just hasn't really developed. I mean, it's hard. When the Ravens use so many tight ends, they use uh, Mark Andrews, they use Nick Boyle, they use Hayden Hurst. It's just uh, it's how their offense goes. I, I, I'm still not exactly scared of him. I've seen some good play from him, but still nothing to be really, like, nothing to write home about. Uh, the biggest one I'm worried about is Marquise Brown. Marquise Brown was hurt in the first Steelers game, and that might have contributed to why the Steelers were able to keep it so close. Uh, I know he played for a little bit, but, I mean, that was nothing comparatively. And now he's mostly healthy. He's, he's got the Ill, illness, whatever it is. And I, I, I don't know if that's going to hold him back at all in this game. But uh, it would be nice if it did. But uh, I think that he's the scariest one. Snead doesn't really do it for me. I liked him better when he was in New Orleans. And then, uh, yeah, I just no one else really does it for me on their offense. That's why I'm not as scared of them. So you've got a team that's a ball control offense, one that hasn't turn the ball over a lot obviously the key is going to be Robert Griffin the third instead of Lamar Jackson <coughs> so that being said Griffin probably you could generate more pressure on him especially with with Marshall Yonda out and you have to hope that he makes some mistakes when Griffin started for the Browns a couple of years ago I think he had, he was responsible for three turnovers so that being said what are kind of like the magic numbers for you in terms of like pressure or turnover rates here what does the Steelers' defense need to do in order to win this game? I think a guaranteed win is three turnovers and five sacks. I think that's a guaranteed win. If the Steelers are able to get three turnovers, which is a lot to ask. I mean, I know it's uh, RG3, but in any given game, it's a lot to ask for three turnovers. But I think that I, I, I can't see the Steelers losing. I mean, the offense is inept, but are they really going to be that inept that they can't capitalize on three turnovers? Uh, I mean, I'm saying it now, and it just I, I can like picture it happening i'll just be angry the entire day but i think those are the magic numbers three turnovers and five sacks and i think that 
both are somewhat realistic in this game. Uh, like I said, the last time I remember RG3, it's just not really great. And then uh, without Marshall Yonda, I feel like the pass rush should be able to do a little bit better on the inside. I'll actually even say, I'll, I'll lower the sack number. I'll, I'll say that's four. Four sacks and three interceptions, I think that the Steelers are guaranteed to win. Uh, we'll put it that way, because that means you're getting enough pressure on RG3 for the most part, and then you're definitely rattling him at least a little bit. So uh, those are the golden numbers for me. How about you? I think that's a fair number to put it at, uh, both of them. So yeah, how just Duck Hodges, are, how are you feeling about him right now? I know that he's a confident guy, but it's been a tough couple of weeks for him. He gets benched, and in that same game, he has to come back off the bench and only 80 80- something 80 think 84 passing yards he's thrown six interceptions in the last two games any hope that he's going to rebound here i'm just i'm not as confident as i wish I, as i want to be because like i the last game was a game to rebound you throw four interceptions and then you rebound against a really bad team this team is i guess you could say really bad in the state they're at well we don't even know that they might actually come out and just whip the Steelers. we don't know but uh, it's just, this is not the game to rebound. Last game was the game to rebound. And I, I don't feel as confident as that. I feel like, like I said, we're going to see Pax and Lynch at some point in this game. Like we've said, well, this is really, what's interesting is both quarterbacks are following a similar trajectory, whether it's Rudolph or Hodges. They came on with early success and then they both kind of struggled and regressed. And Hodges hasn't rebounded from his struggles. Team started blitzing him more, and he hasn't found an answer for that. And now it's not just him. No one else on the team has helped him out whatsoever. Uh, but he hasn't found an answer for when he's being blitzed. And um, until he figures that out, more struggles are going to continue. And he's, de- he's definitely been prone to step into the sack as well. It's really been a problem for him. He's been stepping into the pressure and all and all that. So he's got to figure that out as well in this game, ideally. Or hopefully the offensive line just plays better where there's not as much pressure as there has been in the past like couple of games. But I, I, I don't know about that either. The offensive line's been struggling. Hopefully against a weaker team that, that they'll be able to – I mean, I say weaker, but I mean the Jets and – the Jets are a weak team already without – without anything and it's just they struggled against them so I don't know what's interesting is that both the young quarterbacks have really struggled in running into sacks this year even with the the Steelers offensive line playing poorly the last couple weeks I feel like you could almost put two-thirds so they've given up 30 this year I feel like you could put like half or maybe two-thirds on the quarterbacks exclusively and that's kind of crazy it's just uh, it really feels like the uh quarter I it just doesn't I don't understand why I don't see the pressure coming or don't feel it like it's like they don't watch the tape like what the, to expect or something they don't really know what's happening during the play if it, uh, I don't know man I think we've just, really just I think we've just learned that veteran quarterbacks just are much better at maneuvering the pocket than younger quarterbacks oh for sure it's what it really seems like. It's really an underrated trait, and it really makes you appreciate guys like Roethlisberger or especially a guy like Tom Brady who can maneuver the pocket. Even though he's not a mobile guy, he knows how to get around the pocket to buy himself that extra second as opposed to a guy like Devlin Hodges who might be faster or Mason Rudolph who might be faster, or at least I think he is, but they aren't as a as adept to being able to maneuver the pocket and thus run themselves into sacks. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like going into the next season, sorry to start a tangent, but I feel like going into next season, I think you got to get a veteran quarterback for that exact thing. We've seen the young guy struggle, as you said, and I think that a veteran quarterback would help fix that up. As far as special teams go, we already know the Ravens have one of the best duos in terms of punter and kicker in the league. I don't really think there's much to say about them. DeAnthony Thomas is a guy that's a scary returner, though. He was... He was one of the guys for the Chiefs last year, and he had a big return against the Steelers. He was one of the speedy guys at Oregon back in the day. He's a concern for me. Uh, For me, I'm thinking LJ Ford. I don't know how much special teams he plays in Baltimore, but I know that when he was with the Steelers, he was good at blocking kicks. So he he got a few last year. And uh, I'm going to be worried about him on special teams because I think he plays uh, really well uh, in that area. Any additional storylines we might be missing here? think so uh can one of the tight ends show up in this one? Oh, uh no <laughs> that's <is> my answer <laughs> all right let's move on to our last week for picks and austin you hold a six game advantage going into the final week 
So I need a big one, or I need a big week. And let's start off with the 1 o'clock games. All the games are on Sunday because it's week 17. And we're starting with the 6-9 and nine Atlanta Falcons at the 7-8 and eight Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Tampa Bay getting 1.5. Jameis Winston, two interceptions away from that infamous 30-30 mark. I know I'll be rooting for that. Uh, I am going to pick the Falcons plus one and a half for here. Uh, I just don't really see why the Buccaneers are getting so much respect again. Like, still, no Chris Godwin, no Mike Evans. Uh, and the Falcons have been playing really well. I mean, we, they just beat the 49ers the other week. Like, come on. I'm going to pick the Falcons to uh, to cover here. And I think handily, I think the Falcons might win by two touchdowns. The Falcons have just been one of those weird teams this year. Weren't they... Uh... Weren't they like three and seven at one point this year? I think even worse than that. I think they had like one win and six losses at one point. You are right. They were one and wait a minute. Yeah, they were one and no, they were one and seven. Yeah. Oh, I was close. I said one and six. I was gonna say yeah, and then they turned it up. They did, they did that reverse that one year they had where they started like seven and one and then finished eight and eight. You were you are right though. They did start one and six, but they also were one and seven too. Yeah, so I technically wasn't wrong, but it wasn't the worst that that it was. Your boy Quadri Olison was their leading rusher in the loss to the Buccaneers earlier this year. He had twenty yards. Oh, that's lit. How is Quadri doing? I'm wondering. He's got four I touchdowns. No I, I think I think that leads the team, but he's averaging just over two yards per carry. Damn, bro. I guess they're just using him as a goal line back. Evidently. I mean, whatever works, works, I guess. But anyways, I'll take the Buccaneers to cover because I'll be rooting for Jameis and I got to pick against you this week. And yeah, just uh, I'll, I'm rooting for two picks from Jameis and whatever happens after that happens. Oh, man. Jets at Buffalo Bills. The Jets are 6-9. and nine. The Bills are 10-5. and five. The Bills have locked up the five seat. Excuse me, the five seed in the AFC playoffs, they can't advance or retreat any further than the five seed. So they're likely going to be playing their backup. So even though they're favored by a point and a half at home, I'm going to take the Jets plus the point and a half. Yeah, I'm going to take the Bills. I feel like the Jets are bad, and even though the Steelers lost them, it just says the Steelers are bad. Uh, I think that the uh, Bills' backups could still beat the Jets. So I'm going to pick the Bills to cover here. You sure about that, dude? The Jets have won uh, three of their last, uh, or sorry, how many is this? One, two, three, four, five. They've won six of their last uh, eight games. I Don't they only have five wins? Or sorry, I meant five of their last seven games. They have uh, <laughs> they have six wins. I was so confused, but uh, regardless, anyway. Um, yeah, I'm sure. I'm positive. That game uh, in Buffalo, or sorry, in New Jersey at the beginning of the year, it feels like it could play out like that. The Bills won that game 17-16. to 16. I feel like that could be a very similar result in this one. It is possible. Bears at Vikings. Minnesota getting 6.5 at home. I don't, do the Vikings have anything to play for? Are they locked into the 6, or can they still get the 5? I don't actually know. I'm not sure. I know that they can, I mean, we know they can't get the division now, so they're stuck between the six or the five seed. I know that. Well, actually, the one way to check this, the Seahawks are 11-4, and four, so they could finish 11-5. and five. Uh, They could tie with the Vikings. Let's do a quick uh, ESPN playoff simulator. And uh, you want to filibuster for a second? I'm sorry, what? Do you want to filibuster for a second? Do you know what that is? Uh, yeah, you stand in and talk for, for a while over it. Well, yeah. I don't care. I'm just going to make my pick regardless because I, th- I think that uh, I think the Vikings are going to cover no matter what because uh, I think the Bears – oh, what's it called? I just don't like Mitchell Trubisky still. I mean, he's been playing better, but the Bears' defense hasn't been the same as it was last year. So I am still going to choose the Vikings to cover regardless of who they play. I just – I like them better than the Bears. I know it's a, it's a big – Line. I'm thinking the line says that the, that they're still playing for something. I think if Minnesota is favored by that much, I think they got to be playing for something. This what the Bears playing. Uh, what's it called? What the Bears having played better in the in recent weeks? As far as I can tell, they're uh, as far as I can tell, uh, it doesn't change. Yeah, Minnesota's locked into the number six seed. Kirk Cousins reportedly to sit against the Bears. Oh wow. I'm sticking with it. 
I said all what I said. I'm going to pick the Vikings to cover. I respect it. I'm going to take the Bears plus six and a half. Uh, just, again, I have to pick against you. And they beat the Vikings earlier this season. Six and nine Browns at the one and 14 Bengals. The Bengals are getting two, or sorry, they're two and a half point uh, home underdogs. The Bengals can afford to win this game since they have the number one pick, but the Browns are a more talented team. And even though they've been a mess this year, I have a hard time seeing them losing this game. So give me the Browns to cover. Uh, For me, I'm going to pick the Browns to cover as well. I mean, that spread was a little bit too small. I mean, they've been struggling and the Bengals have been playing well, but I mean, I can't not pick the Browns to cover here. 12-3 Twelve and three Packers at the three eleven and one Lions. Detroit is a ten and a half point underdog at home. I'll take the Lions plus ten and a half. The Packers haven't been blowing anyone out recently, and even though they still need to win this game, the Lions I think are going to play them tough. They've recently activated Carry on Johnson, so they have a nice weapon back on offense. For me, I'm going to pick the Packers to cover. I think that the Packers are going to play hard for their uh, trying to get a better playoff spot, and uh, I, I think overall. Uh, they're going to play better. I wish Jamal Williams was playing in terms of for this. I mean, I have Aaron Jones in fantasy, so I'm hoping for Aaron Jones to go off. But, I mean, uh, I think Jamal Williams would have been a nice complimentary back to have, and he's not going to be playing. So there is that. But uh, I'm going to still pick the Packers to cover. 5-10 and ten Chargers at the 11-4 and four Chiefs. The, st- the Chiefs still have a shot at the second seed, so they have something to play for. They're a touchdown and a half favorite here at home. I think they're going to win by a lot. I just I don't have faith in the Chargers at this point. Uh, I will also take the Chiefs to cover. I, I don't have faith, faith in the Chargers like you said. Uh, I don't really have much else to say about that game, actually. 4-11 Dolphins at the 12-3 and three Patriots. The Patriots are getting 15. It feels like the Dolphins should be able to keep this close, but since it's in New England and it's late December, I'll take the Patriots to cover. I don't know what it is about the Dolphins, but the Patriots seem to struggle against them the most, even when they're bad. So I'm going to pick them plus the points. It's just too big of a spread for an offense that hasn't been getting it together like whatsoever. So I will choose the Dolphins plus 15 and a half. 12 and 3 Saints at the 5 and 10 Panthers. These are two teams heading in opposite directions. A 13 and a half point spread is not enough for me to pick the Panthers. I, the Saints feel like the, they're playing the best football of any team in the league right now. Yeah, honestly, I just I, I the Panthers are starting Will Greer again, right? Like it's just automatic. I, I can't automatic. Yeah, L. I can't justify it. Like I I don't know. It would be hard for me. Like if it was a twenty point spread. I I think it'd be really hard for me to pick the uh, the Panthers still. Like I, I I definitely I think I'd end up with the Panthers on a twenty point spread. But it's just like uh, the Saints should blow them out here. Like it, they should watch. Like the Panthers keep it competitive, but. Still, I'm going to take the Saints to cover here. Three and twelve Redskins at the seven and eight Cowboys. Dallas, like the Steelers, lost control of their fate for the playoffs. They're still getting ten and a half points here, but it, it's got the feeling of a team ready to implode. It seems like they're ready to hit the reset button. Yeah, I thought that spread was way too much. Uh, I'm going to pick the Redskins plus ten and a half in this this game. It's just. I, I don't have faith like that in the Cowboys with how bad they're playing. We saw them lose to the, the Eagles. The Eagles don't have like any wide receivers or any defensive backs, and the defensive backs were able to shut down the Dolphins enough. Like, and that was just really sad to me. So, uh, I just I'm gonna pick uh, I'm gonna pick the Redskins plus ten and a half. This would just be the biggest middle finger to Dallas fans everywhere if they go out there, blow out the Redskins, and still don't make the playoffs, and that's what I'm predicting will happen. I think that's fair. Totally could see it happen. Seven and eight Raiders at the six and nine Broncos. The Raiders actually still have a chance to make the playoffs. They're the least likely of the outside teams looking in, but it's still possible. But that being said, the Broncos have been a different team with Drew Locke this year. Even when, even though they got blown out by the Chiefs a couple weeks ago. They're playing like a much better team. Remember, they started very slow, too. I like the Broncos to cover three and a half points. Uh, I also like the Broncos to cover three and a half points. I just think that they're the better team. And, I mean, the Raiders don't have Josh Jacobs. And, to me, Josh Jacobs would have been the difference maker. So I am going to choose the uh, Raiders to – not the Raiders. I'm sorry. I am going to choose the Broncos to cover. The 7 and 8 Colts at the 5 and 10 Jaguars. The Colts are getting three and a half on the road. 
I just don't trust the Jaguars right now. So I'm going to take the Colts to cover, even though they haven't been playing particularly great this year. I just think they're top to bottom a better team. Yeah, I agree. I think that the Colts are going to cover here. I it just Jacksonville hasn't played well at all, especially in recent weeks. Like the best they did was against the Raiders, where they came back. But like the Raiders were playing bad at the time, so I just I don't trust them at all. Cardinals at five nine and one at the eight and seven Los Angeles Rams. The Rams just got eliminated from playoff contention, but they're still seven and a half point favorites. Due in no small part to the fact that Kyler Murray might not play in this game. He's a game time decision. So with that in mind. I think the Rams will win this game by a little more than a touchdown. The NFC West is weird. I will grant you that, and I know that you will acknowledge that. But I am going to err on caution here and say that Kyler Murray is not going to play. Yeah, to me, I, I don't see why you play Kyler Murray. You're now – this is the last game uh, of the season. you got to go into next year and hope that your rookie quarterback is uh, – your well, now would be your sophomore quarterback, but you want him to be healthy – I wouldn't risk it in this game, and I mean, it gets you a better draft pick. The Cardinals didn't trade away their uh, first-round pick, so to me, uh, it's just not worth it at all for me to play Kyler Murray. So I think that they're not going to play him. And that being said, uh, who is their backup? I'm still going to pick the Card. Ah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I was going to pick the Cardinals plus seven and a half without even knowing. Uh, Let me check that for backup. you right now. Their backup, according to ESPN, yeah. so take that. As you will, is Brett Hundley. That's right. Brett Hundley, the old uh, Packers and Browns backup. Oh, cool. Good for them. Uh, I still I, – I said what I said again. I'm sticking with the uh, I'm sticking with the Cardinals plus seven and a half. Hundley has thrown ten passes this year. He's completed four of them for 49 yards. Oh, How you? sorry. I pulled up his page and it started playing uh, an ESPN video. I hate ESPN. I hate them for that. Like, they're just the worst. And it's what's annoying is that you can mute that, and if I pull up another player's, it'll unmute it. Yeah, like, you, you sure you don't want to hear it the first time, sir? Are you sure? I hate that stuff. But anyways, uh, you are still taking the Cardinals plus 7.5, correct? That is correct. Okay, and I'll take the Rams lay 7.5 for me. Uh, the other NFC East game, this one is the 8-7 and seven Eagles at the 4-11 and 11 Giants. Giants are plus four and a half right now. I'll take them plus four and a half. I know that the Eagles were able to beat the Cowboys by eight last week. I just have a hard time thinking they'll be able to blow out anybody right now, uh, including the Giants. They struggled with them a couple weeks ago in Philadelphia. I think the Eagles get the win. I'll thread the needle here, but the Giants will keep it close. Make it a field goal game that will up upset Cowboys fans even more because the Cowboys will blow out the Redskins and the Eagles will scrape by but will still win the division because of it. Yeah, that that would hurt for the Cowboys. I'm going to pick the Eagles to cover. I think that they can win by five points against the Giants. I just think that the uh, Daniel Jones-led Giants are turnover prone. So I will choose uh, the Eagles to cover. Are the Giants the only other team with more turnovers than the Steelers? It feels like I feel like they're one of those teams. I mean, obviously the Gi- uh, the Buccaneers have to be one of those teams too. But uh, yeah, the uh, the Steelers aren't even in thirtieth. Uh, I think they're in twenty seventh for turnovers with twenty eight. Daniel Jones only has uh, eleven interceptions. I'm sure he's fumbled the ball a lot though. Yeah, I, that's probably it. One last 4 o'clock game. This is the one that Steelers fans are going to be paying a lot of attention to. Is the 8-7 and seven Titans and the 10-5 and five Houston Texans. The Titans are 4.5-point favorites because the Texans may not have anything to play for. Let's talk a little bit about this game. So the Steelers are going to need the Texans to win this game. And we talked a little bit about it off-air. But the Texans are home. They did beat the Titans earlier this year. But it, you have to think that the Titans are a team that should be able to win this game given the circumstances. Yeah, uh, I'm basically pick, picking the Texans plus four and a half with just hope. Hope that the Texans pull it out and win this game, but I'm not exactly confident. I think the Texans are going to end up benching their starters and uh, after the first quarter, and I just think that uh, because of that, uh, the Titans are going to be able to win, even if they don't have Derrick Henry. Uh, it's just, it is what it is. Yeah, the Titans have a lot more to play for. Look, it would be as disappointing as it would be for the Steelers to not win the game on Sunday. I think that there's a lot of people who think that the Ravens should still be able to beat the Steelers. I don't really think there's anyone that thinks the Texans should really be able to beat the Titans, just given how 
the Titans are probably a really even team with the Texans. I mean, they played close to two weeks ago. And when you take out, you know, five to seven or ten of the Texans' best players, there's no reason to think the Titans shouldn't be able to win then. Yeah, the one thing that maybe you could say is that uh, you just they're maybe playing hard to not let their opponent get into the uh, into the playoffs. But that same could be said for the Steelers and Ravens game. The Ravens are still going to be playing hard because they don't want a division opponent to make it into the playoffs. They'll but, be uh, playing hard regardless. I, I don't think yeah. it's an issue of playing hard. I think it's. I'm just kind of getting at more like the talent disparity once you take out their best players. Yeah, no, for sure. So that being said, that'll bring us to Sunday night. This is the really interesting game. You've got two teams battling for a first round bye potentially in the 49ers at 12 and three who haven't played very well lately. They're two and two in their last four or the 11 and four Seahawks who did beat the Niners earlier this year in our home but they've also lost their top three running backs and are going to be turning to Robert Turbin and Marshawn Lynch to carry the rock. So the Niners are now three-and-a-half-point favorites. This should still be a pretty fun game, I think. Yeah, I still feel like the Seahawks are going to keep it within three-and-a-half even if they lose. So I'm going to pick Seattle plus three-and-a-half. I think that Seattle's going to win, though. I have a funny feeling. Like, I, I don't know if anything special is going to happen, but... Uh, I think that the Seahawks would come in here, and I mean, it's at home. It's in the 12th, man, and that's always hard to play. And so uh, I'm going to pick the Seahawks plus three and a half. You know what's interesting is you might initially think the Niners should win because of all the injuries to the Seahawks running backs. But you know what's interesting? I think this is Jimmy Garoppolo's first start in Seattle, right? Uh, I think uh, so. I believe so. So you coupled that with the fact that this is not the first time, believe it or not, that Russell Wilson's had to carry this team. You know what I mean? I mean, how, how many times has he done this over his career? Oh, a lot. There was a time where there was no offense line at all in Seattle. Now it's still they still don't really even have that great of an offensive line, but it's better than what it was. I think that there's a legitimate chance that Russell Wilson could kind of put the team on his back here, and the Niners have struggled. They gave up 29 to the Falcons, 46 to the Saints, and 31 to the Rams the last three weeks. Uh, I'm talk. I'm trying to talk myself down here. I'm still going to pick the Niners to cover just because I think it's a lot for the Seahawks to lose their top three backs. But I, I think that this is going to be a close game, and I think all the Niners are going to win by a little more than four, four or more in this case. But I think this was easily the best game to flex, and they made the right choice. Well, yeah, I mean, it's coming down to who – Who's going to be a, a fifth seed, or who's going to be uh, like I don't I don't even know. Does whoever win this have a chance at a first round bye? I think so. Well, the Niners do. The 49ers do. I think it. I think the Niners do, and if the Seahawks win, I think it depends on what the Packers do. So this has a lot of implications for a lot of teams. It most certainly does. So it's it's a big deal for sure. Let's get into some Steelers news. Just two quick things to mention. Number one is that Devin Bush won the Joe Green Award, which is annually awarded to the Steelers' top rookie. Bush is second on the team in total tackles with 97. To go with one sack, a forced fumble, and two interceptions. And all of this is impressive because he has split time with other inside linebackers, Mark Barron and Vince Williams, this year. Certainly a well-deserved honor, but we were talking a little bit yesterday about how even though Bush deserves it, Deontay Johnson should be you know, an honorable mention as well. He's six receptions away from the team rookie record for catches in a season. And there's a good chance that he leads all rookie wide receivers in catches this year. Uh, uh, Terry McLaurin, who was three catches ahead of him, has been declared out for the Redskins. So he's got to make four catches to lead all rookies in, uh, in, in catches this year. And then he's also just got to outpace uh, DK Metcalf, who Metcalf has is three catches behind Johnson right now. So, uh, I mean, there's a good chance, and honestly, it should have been. I, I thought they could have been uh, co-winners of this award because uh, be, because they've both done some incredible stuff. But, I mean, I, I do understand why Devin Bush won it. I mean, Devin Bush, if he was given more playing time, would have probably put up even more incredible stats. So, there's that. It is impressive, though, that Bush has done pretty much everything that we've expected that he could do but he's still been limited in his playing time, and he's almost been kind of forgotten at times because of it. Yeah, and it, it's almost not fair because I think if he got more playing time, he could have like into like 110s of tackles. 
completely agree with you. And as far as Johnson goes, man, not bad for a guy that I thought was going to catch less than 30 passes, a guy that was you know, supposedly worried about hitting the rookie wall. Rookie wall. And here we are. He's still playing great, uh, at least compared to what we thought uh, going forward. Yeah, honestly, great from him. And he's always going to be tied to the Antonio Brown trade, so that's just something else to mention. Oh, yeah. That's going to be fun for uh, his whole career. I'm sure he'll get tired of it. And if you want to talk about drawing, you know, the whole trade thing, tying each other together, Deontay Johnson will always be uh, will always be kind of linked to Santonio San Holmes then by proxy. Isn't that kind of interesting? Yeah, it's kind of crazy how the uh, wide receivers are all connected. <laughs> Steelers still know how to draft him, that's for sure. And then the second note was that Cameron Hayward won the Chief Award for cooperation with the media, and I know that that might seem kind of trivial, but I thought it was kind of nice to see that he won the award because if you want one guy on your team to be really good with the media, you'd want it to be your team captain, and I think that he's represented himself well in this instance. Yeah, Cameron Hayward was a good uh, uh, good choice for this award. I feel like every time he talks to me, he's always saying the right thing, so I, I thought this was a good choice. Free agent wide receiver Antonio Brown was one of six players that the New Orleans Saints brought in for a workout today on Friday. The Saints coach, Sean Payton, talked to reporters later in the day, said that despite the workouts, the Saints had no plans to sign any of them at this point. With the NFL's legal investigation on Brown still ongoing, it's likely he'd be placed on the commissioner's exempt list if he would sign somewhere until the investigation concludes, of course. Brown has played in just one game, which was week two for the Patriots in 2019. Do you, what do you make of this right now? Uh, honestly, I think the Saints were just doing their due diligence. They, they said that they were doing it just in case an injury happened, and, I mean, all, everything points to that they didn't sign anyone. And uh, they were well, they are waiting to see if Antonio Brown uh, would be able to play for the playoffs to be able to sign him. Uh, that would be a really nasty wide receiver core with Antonio Brown and Michael Thomas. You'd have, like, the best, and, I mean, no, you can't say I, – can you say second best wide receiver if he hasn't played – like in NFL, like together. I mean that at at points they've both been the best wide receiver. I think Michael Thomas is the best wide receiver this year. I mean he broke the reception record, and uh, at times Antonio Brown has been the best wide receiver. It would have been nasty to have have them together, but I don't think it's going to happen. I want to know who else the Saints brought in. Who are those other five guys? Uh, I don't really remember. I know one is Maurice Harris, the old uh, Redskins wide receiver. I don't know the other four. Where's Justin Hunter? He's still no, on the team, sit, isn't he? Sitting at home. Isn't he on the team, Justin Hunter? I don't think so. I, oh, Justin Hunter. I'll never forget. As much as we ribbed on him, I just think it was so sad how his Steelers career ended by him like separating his shoulder on a pass that Ben overthrew him. I hate to see it. <laughs> All right. Let's get into the Steelers game one last time. X Factors and Bold Prediction. I have a trivia question for you, Austin. The Steelers uh, are looking to continue an impressive winning streak. They've won 11 straight games in the season finale. They've beaten the Browns a whole bunch of times, but this year they finished with the Ravens, obviously. So my question to you is, who is the last team the Steelers lost to on the in the season finale, which would have been what did I say, eleven years ago? Yeah, Ravens in two thousand seven. Yes, sir. You are correct. So you can choose to defer or take the first pick. But in that uh, in that game eleven years ago, it was Troy Smith and Charlie Batch starting. So uh, just kind of interesting. It was not a meaningful game for the Steelers. That's why Batch was several times. The big plays. They're probably not going to come in the passing game. And as far as the ground game, it's been pretty much stuck in neutral aside from a couple of big runs from uh, Benny Snell at points this year. Kareth White's been that spark plug for him. And if they're going to move the ball, if they're going to get those chunk plays, it's going to come from a guy like Kareth White in space. So if Kareth White can come up with two or three explosive one, uh, runs, that could be the difference for the Steelers, at least on offense. So that's going to be my offensive X factor. For a bold prediction, I think he's going to have a 40-yard 40-plus yard touchdown run. That's my bold prediction for Kareth White. All right. So my new offense and defense. So for on offense, it's going to be Ramon Foster. He's been struggling the past few weeks. I think that he's going to need to step up and uh, play well, give uh, Devlin Hodges a clean pocket, 
And uh, so my my uh, bold prediction for the entire offense is going to be that they give up no sacks in this game. So I, I think that's good enough. And then uh, on defense, I'm going to pick – I originally had Minka Fitzpatrick, but I'm going to pick someone that I think should, needs to have, like, one good game this year because there's no game where I feel like he could hang his hat on, and that's Terrell Edmonds. He's playing up against a lot of backups here. I think that against RG3, he'd get his first pick of the year. And uh, I'm going to make him my X actor. I'm going to say that. I think that he uh, – my bold prediction for him is – Five plus tackles and an interception, and uh, those are my X factors of bull predictions. What's your last one? My defensive X factor is going to be Minka Fitzpatrick. You went with the other safety, Terrell Edmonds. I think Minka. This is a game for him to finally come out and have another solid game. It, he's had, to, like I said on the last show, he's touched the ball one time in the last six weeks. RG3 throwing the ball is not nearly as scary as Lamar Jackson, and I think this could be a big game for Fitzpatrick, so I'm going to have him down for two interceptions and one touchdown. I believe that would be his third of the season, so give me Minka Fitzpatrick with two interceptions and one touchdown. So that's my defensive X factor and bold predictions on that end. So top to bottom, it should be a relatively low-scoring game, perhaps a really low-scoring game. Obviously, you've got some things in the Steelers' favor. Even though they've struggled the last two weeks to put up points, the defense is playing well. The special teams hasn't been awful. They've been doing okay. And the Ravens are going to be without the MVP of the league and a handful of other good starters. Evens the odds a little bit. The Ravens are two-and-a-half-point underdogs to the Steelers right now, but this is a game that the Steelers need to win to, to have a chance to get in. The Ravens have nothing to play for. So that being taken into account, where are you leaning in this game and why? Uh, I'm going to pick the Ravens to win 9-6. I think that overall, I feel like the Steelers are really good at playing down to their opponent. And I mean, granted, those Steelers aren't even the best team right now. They're not really good. The offense has really been struggling. Uh, I just think that they're going to struggle here. And I think that the Ravens still keeping Marlon Humphrey and uh, possibly Marlon Humphrey and possibly uh, Marcus Peters. It's just going to be too tough for the offense to overcome. And I think that RG3 is going to just get them in uh, to the red zone enough where, I mean, the Reds, uh, being able to score for Justin Tucker is so far out. I mean, they just really have to just kind of get over the 50-yard line, and they're basically there. That's obviously an exaggeration, but I think that there will be an offensive mistake, uh, a turnover that leads Baltimore to good field position, maybe even more than once. Uh, so I think that the Ravens win 9-6. Low score affair because I still don't trust an RG3. I still think he's going to make his mistakes. I just don't trust in the Steelers' offense. What do you got? I think the Steelers' defense is going to have a little more trouble this week. Ravens obviously are going to be big on running the football, and that's the one area where the Steelers' defense has at times been inconsistent this year. The Ravens obviously like to stay on schedule, and even though I think RG3 is going to make his share of mistakes and I have the Steelers scoring, Uh, Two touchdowns in this one. I have one of them being defensive. I just, until the Steelers' offense scores multiple touchdowns in a game, I'm not going to believe that it's possible. It's gotten to that point. That's how bad it has been. So, you know, what you need from the Steelers' offense, as we know, is to not turn the football over and to bury those turnovers that the defense gets into touchdowns. And I'm just not sure that they can do that consistently enough. So give me the Ravens in a slim... 23-14 23-14 to 14 victory. I think the score doesn't really reflect how it goes. I think a late duck turnover or a Paxton Lynch turnover gives the Ravens an extra field goal to make it 23-14 to 14 when it had been a one-score game. So I'll take the Ravens plus 2.5. And, and the Steelers most likely miss the playoffs, so yay! But we'd love to see the Steelers in the playoffs, but... Man, this has been quite a roller coaster season. Starting one and four, you feel like it'd be amazing if they finished at five hundred. Then they win seven of eight, and then now, honestly, you're at, you're like it's a disappointment if they don't make the playoffs. Yeah, you just got your hopes up for a lot, and then it's just they lose two games against the Bills and Jets, and both are winnable games. So it's just really sad. Even like slightly below average quarterback play in those games probably wins you those games. Yeah, the four turnovers in the Buffalo Bills game was really rough. You, you you cut that down to two, and you probably still win that game. Obviously, as is the case with any team, you're looking at potentially a lot of roster turnover following the season. I wanted to shine the spotlight on a handful of players whose contracts are up at the end of the season. 
could be the last time we see these guys in a Steelers uniform or if they're not playing on the sideline. So that being the case, uh, let's talk about these guys briefly and kind of what you think about them this year and if you think they'll be brought back or whatnot. So let's start with Bud Dupree. He's the biggest name that the Steelers are going to be trying to bring back. It could be his last season, but I think even if the Steelers aren't able to get a long-term deal done, you've put the franchise tag on him. I think bringing him back is pretty important. But to end up king as a Steeler, I just they could let him go after having a season like this. I just hope that it wasn't because he was in a contract year that he was playing this at a high level. I hope that he can continue it. I Although I understand continue. people's concerns, I think the biggest thing is just that he's been healthy this year. Yeah, for sure. Javon Hargrave is the other big defensive piece that's a free agent. Unfortunately, I think it's just quite frankly impossible that he comes back, unless if for some reason he takes way below market value, which he has no reason to, he's going to be gone. And on Bud Dupree's sack last Sunday, man, he, he made a fantastic play. That dude is going to get paid. Hello? Hello? Looks like we might have lost Austin there. All right, we'll uh, attempt to reestablish the call here. So that being said, uh, just talking about Javon Hargrave and the fact that he's probably not going to be brought back. Uh, can you hear me, Austin? I can hear you a little bit better now. It's still cutting in and out, but, I mean, it's uh, more doable now. So uh, Javon Hargrave, the dude's going to get paid, right? This has to be – I mean, th- I have to think this is his last game in Pittsburgh. Yeah, thanks for the third-round comp pick in the future, Hargrave, but there's just no way he could come back. And, I mean, uh, he he's actually playing a lot of snaps this year, but that's only because two it's hurt. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a guy you don't want to lose. I'm not happy about it, but it's a guy you can afford to lose. It's not – Bud Dupree you can't really afford to lose with the backups there. It's like we've said all along, Hargrave is just a luxury. And although he's awesome, it's something that, like you just said, you can more afford to lose. That being said, enjoy Hargrave in the uniform because this is going to be it. Uh, BJ Finney on the offensive side now. This is an interesting one because we talked about it at length on the last show that we thought for a long time he was going to be the guy to replace Ramon Foster now maybe not so much. There's a good chance I don't think he comes back at all. Yeah, um, it's tough. I know he wants to be there. It's going to be if the team wants him. Uh, well, it also is who, who, I think it's, who, who could possibly pay him more than what the Steelers are going to pay him. And I think I, I have an answer. I want to know if you think that if you are thinking the same thing I'm thinking. Cutting in and out again. Uh, I'm thinking that you're thinking the Bengals, though. So. I'm actually thinking the Broncos and Mike Munchak. I'm still cutting out, aren't I? Lovely. All right. We're going to try this again just like we did last time. I hate the Discord's doing this. You hate to see that happen. I don't know what's happening over, over the past few weeks. It's kind of- It's right at the end, too. We couldn't just finish it off. No, there's always got to be some sort of complications. Anyways, um, the team I was bringing up was or th- was thinking about was the Denver Broncos and Mike Munchak. Yeah, that's definitely a possibility. Uh, I, I, I obviously he like groomed Finney to be the guy he is, so they could definitely bring him over, play guard. Tyler Medikevich, he has been the best Steelers probably best special teams player the last handful of years. He leads the NFL in special teams tackles. But Robert Spillane is a guy that's been playing well on special teams and could probably play at a cheaper price. So I think there's a good possibility, even though I like Tyler Manikiewicz, I think it's possible he's gone. Yeah, I just think that I think he's going to actually get a, a nice contract on the market. Not like anything crazy, not starting money, but like for what he does on special teams, he's led the league in special team tackles two years in a row now. Like, come on. Like, he's going to get any he has starting experience. It might not be good starting experience, but he has done it. So uh, I think that that's going to make him valuable in both senses. That I mean, he's going to be taken as a special teams guy, but I mean, at the end of the day, he has played defense before. So uh, I think that uh, I think that this is I would like him to come back, but I think he's going to get like a three million dollar contract somewhere, like like a pretty good amount of money. 
So what's going to happen with he sign when he signs with the Patriots and Steelers Nation revolts? Oh, that would that would be trash. <laughs> uh, trash would be an a great and accurate way to describe the tight end position, including Nick Vanette for the most part this year. His contract is up, and we've talked a little bit about it already, but is there a chance that he's not brought back? I have to think that there's a chance he comes back, but I'm not sold on it right now. Yeah, there's a good chance he's not coming back. I just think that the Steelers are still going to try and make it work. I think they're going to give him a contract or, and try and make him say, I can't see him getting a big contract somewhere else. So that's why I think the Steelers can retain him, and I think it's just best to give him a uh, full like off season to learn the learn the playbook to really study it. And uh, I think he could get better. So I think the Steelers are going to offer him a contract, and it's not going to be too bad. Last two guys, both are players that I think are going to be gone, and that's uh, Artie Burns and Sean Davis from the 2016 class. Yeah, I'm not sure Artie Burns is going to find a team. Uh, Sean Davis might be able to because he he's flashed more recently, but I mean. Both are going to be struggling to find teams. They might be guys that are signed after the period where it stops counting against the comp pick. Uh, Burns, I'm just, I'm still not sure of. I, I don't, I just don't think he's going to be able to find a team with how bad he plays special teams. It's going to be hard for him. I think they'll both find training camps, and I think Davis will have a shot to play significant snaps, but neither are going to get paid much. Yeah, I mean, you think of it, Jarvis Jones even sat in the training camp, and they, yeah, Jarvis Jones, in my opinion, was worse than Artie Burns, so, you know. So here we are, just uh, probably a couple months away from the first three picks of the 2016 draft class. All three defensive contributors, and they seemingly had a bright future in 2016 and 17, but, I, I mean, Hargrave has played well, but the top three guys are going to be gone, and two of them have been not very impactful lately. No, and they didn't even elect to keep take Sean Davis off of IR, which I don't know why that worries me. But he might uh, still be hurt, though. That's the thing. I'm not. I yeah, mean, no. we we don't know. We're not going to know, but that's a possibility. Yeah, I guess so. All right, so Austin, this could be the last time we're previewing a Steelers game for the season. I, I really feel like it shouldn't be ending this week, but I mean, it very well could be over. Yeah, I just hope they end it with a win. I hope we're not being really depressed where it's like a big loss and it's just like the Titans. And what's going to really hurt is if if the uh, Steelers and Titans lose. Like that's that's going to really hurt at the heartstrings and the Titans still make it. I, I forget what ha- has to happen because I, I don't know if we talked about it, but the Steelers could still make the playoffs if, if the Steelers and Titans both lose, but it's more than likely the Titans would make the playoffs if the Steelers and Titans both lose. And then the Raiders have a chance that that happens as well, but yeah. Above uh, everything, just win. Yeah. Just end the season strong. I, I just want to prove my friends wrong. Uh, I don't. I forget if I discussed this with you, but I'll say it on the podcast. Before the season even started, uh, my, my Bills fan friend and my Jets fan friend, which is uh, ironic, I was wishing it happened one of the past two weeks, uh, they said that the Steelers would be lucky to finish with more than six wins. I told them they're going to go nine and seven. And this was before, obviously, Ben Roethlisberger was hurt. And uh, stuff, and I'm waiting to use that screenshot of where where I said that they'd go nine and seven, and just say I knew what, what my team would do, and I was under the impression that they had Ben Roethlisberger at the time. So uh, I'm hoping for this one last win to so I could just prove my friends wrong. In the meantime, if you have any questions about the show, please feel free to email us at strongerthansteelpodcast at gmail dot com, and check out our website strongerthansteelnfl.blogspot.com. We hope you've enjoyed listening to us this season, and hopefully we'll be talking about a Steelers win and uh, hopefully a playoff appearance next week. But in case it isn't, we wanted to th- uh, we wanted to thank you for listening this year and uh, hope you stay listening if uh, the season does end. We'll be talking about wrapping up the 2019 season, and then we'll be getting into draft coverage, which, I mean, I'd rather not do it this early, but at least it's something to take your mind off of what happened. Yeah, hopefully we don't get there that soon, and if, we don't podcast before it. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody. Enjoy 2020. It's, we're entering a new decade. Uh, Happy New Year. Favorite Steelers memory this decade, real quick. Oh, the Immaculate Extension. Quite fair. I was actually going to go with that as well. Uh, Runner-up would probably be, at least for me, beating the Jets in the AFC Championship game in 2011. Oh, yeah. I just... I, I can't remember a better feeling than seeing the Immaculate Extension 
Like, the only thing that comes close is all, it's something similar. It's just the game didn't mean as much. But I think of Le'Veon Bell stretching over the last three seconds in the Chargers game where Mike Vick was starting. And, like, it's, like, those endings that are just, like, that, that last effort. Like, it, it's that, it, it's those, you know? Yeah, it's those... It's those season-defining and, uh, you know, game-defining plays. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, until next time, thank you, as always, for listening to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. Happy New Year, and have a terrific uh, start to your 2020. Take care, everybody. Bye, guys. You have been listening to Stronger Than Steel podcast. Thank you for joining us today, and don't forget to check out our website listed in the description below.